Please take your seat. We want to uh, continue our program. Okay, we, we're going to continue our program now. P please take your seat. The phone number. And I have his uh, university address and email and phone number in case you want to contact him. Uh, again, his name is Miguel Soto, S-O-T-O, -O, and his email address is M-E-S-E -E at Servidor, S-E-R-V-I-D-O-R dot Unum, U-N-A-M dot M-X. And, uh, okay, the, it is M-E-S-E -E at S-E-R-V-I-D-O-R dot U-N-A-M dot M-X. Uh, and it is uh, Facultad de Filosofia y Letras, Ciudad Universita, Unum, 04310, Mexico, DF. So, anybody wants to contact him. We, we will now go on to our next speaker. Um, next speaker is Jim Crisp, who is a graduate of Rice University and has received a master's and doctoral degrees in history from Yale. He's a prolific writer and lecturer on Texas history. He's currently an associate professor of history at North Carolina State University. He recently appeared on the History Channel and has written the introduction to the new edition of uh, Jose Enrique de la Pena's uh, With Santa Ana in Texas. Uh, Dr. Chris's topic is When Did Mexico Lose Texas? The Quest for the Irreversible Moment. Please join me in welcoming Jim Chris. Thank you, Jeff. The quest for the irreversible moment is so pretentious a title, and it brings me to my first uh, up, uh, uh, admission. Uh, Jeff referred to cutting-edge history before. What that means is that when he asked me to talk here, I didn't know what I was going to say. Uh, so this really is cutting-edge history, about as fresh as you can get it. Um, also, I thought I was going to be safe, since we're well past the death of Davy Crockett by uh, April. Uh, and I've gotten in plenty of trouble over, over that issue in the last few years. Uh, and then when I found out what I was going to say today and realized I was going to say it to a group of San Jacinto enthusiasts, I, uh, I realized I was in more trouble uh, than Filosolo and Urea. Um, about 300 years ago, Francis Bacon said that truth arises more readily from error than from confusion. Uh, that's an important uh, uh, research uh, 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 precept to keep in mind, uh, an important precept of, of, uh, of uh, the quest for knowledge. Uh, sometimes making a mistake uh, is the best way to advance knowledge. Any scientist worth his salt uh, knows that that's how you have to proceed. Um, my corollary to Francis Bacon's dictum, the truth arises more readily from error than from confusion, is that it's almost as much fun to be proven wrong as it is to be proven right. Uh, and so I hope you'll take in that spirit that I'm looking for a great deal of fun today. Um, from the University of Houston campus, it's about 15 miles east of San Jacinto, with that magnificent monument and that, uh, those ceremonies that are planned for tomorrow. And obviously the reason for the monument and the ceremonies is that, that this is ostensibly where Texas independence was won on April 21st, 1836. And if you look at the base of the monument, a chain of events begun which led to the United States annexing not only Texas but the entire American Southwest. Uh, there's a lesser known monument 40 miles to the southwest of us on Turkey Creek uh, near the western edge of Fort Bend County. Uh, it was also, like the San Jacinto Monument, erected in the 1930s, but it's not quite as tall. Right now it's six inches tall. Originally, of course, this stood five or six feet tall, 
but now that the cattle have knocked it over on its back, since it's on private ranch land, it's only about six inches tall. This is a Texas Centennial Monument. If you look around you from there, you don't see much. Uh, there are no obvious clues that anything of significance had ever occurred here, yet if you take a metal detector and run it over the land right there, it goes nuts. And the reason is, uh, more than anything else, the nails. This is one of them right here. Lots and lots of nails and musket balls and stirrups and trigger guards and countless other odds and ends dropped or discarded when three Mexican armies converged here on April 25th of 1836 to decide what to do in the aftermath of the Battle of San Jacinto. This is the site of Mrs. Powell's Tavern, La Batacion de Madame Powell. And although that place name doesn't appear very often in traditional Texas history. It appears again and again and again in the Mexican documents and historiography having to do with what Jeff has called the second phase of the San Jacinto campaign and what uh, Greg will also be talking about, uh, the Mexican retreat. A wayside inn on a crossroad of, with roads going off to Matagorda and San Felipe and Harrisburg uh, and other sites known to Texans uh, well of, of the early 1830s, it was here that the decision was made by the Mexican high command about what to do. And the armies then set fire to Mrs. Powell's tavern. That's why you don't see it in those pictures. And they departed to the southwest, not to the northeast. And Sam Houston and his tiny army were safe. Let me explain why I believe that, me that Mexico lost Texas at Mrs. Powell's Tavern. The conventional wisdom tells us that they lost it and that Texas won its independence at San Jacinto, and there's no question that it was an impressive victory, a sweeping victory, and all of you know about it, and I'm not here from North Carolina to tell you uh, anything about the Battle of San Jacinto. But I think you should know that professional military historians tend to disagree that this was the pivotal moment. The Texas State Historical Association booklet on San Jacinto, uh, uh, published by James W. Pohl, uh, says that, rightly I think, that San Jacinto was a decisive tactical victory. A tactical victory. But the bulk of the Mexican armies in Texas were nearby and could have continued to fight should they have chosen to do that. Strategically, Houston's little army was still quite vulnerable, and the success of the revolution remained in doubt on the 22nd and the 23rd. It hadn't been won on the 21st. According to Pohl, it was General Vicente Filasola's decision to obey Santa Ana's orders and leave Texas that really put an end to the Texas Revolution. But Pohl's colleague, Stephen Hardin, the author of the prize-winning Military History of the Revolution, Texi and Iliad, Stephen Hardin reminds us that Filosola always maintained that orders or no orders, he had no recourse but to retreat. Indeed, Filosola made his two most important retrograde movements before he had any idea whether Santa Ana was alive or dead. Could we have the map of the uh, area on the... Uh, Overhead, please. His first move came on around the 23rd uh, of April as he moved from Old Fort here back to Mrs. Powell's. Uh, these are the footsteps that Uriah had made on his movement into Texas. That's what these lines are here. He, these are just his, the path that he, trod, that he tread. Trod? Did trod. Um, but Filasola, Gaona, Sesma, and most of the Mexican army was right here at Fort Bend when they got wind of what had happened at San Jacinto. And they heard of it within 24 hours when the first horseman came in uh, to tell them of the disaster. Um, 
The first movement, and I'll talk about it in greater detail in just a moment, was from Old Fort back to Mrs. Powell's here on Turkey Creek, very near the San Bernards, about a mile south of 59 uh, near Kendleton on Turkey Creek, on the west end of Fort Bend County. The next move that Filasola took was across the San Bernard River, moving towards eventually a crossing on the Colorado, and again he made this movement before he knew whether Santa Ana was alive or dead. He had no orders. So the first key moves uh, to the southwest, uh, uh, away from the Texas Army, were made by General Filosola without any reference to orders from Santa Ana whatsoever. And even after he received the news of Santa Ana's capture and El Presidente's order to fall back, Filosola claimed that he was only pretending to follow Santa Ana's orders so as to hide the true weakness of the Mexican army from the enemy. In other words, not saying, you're damn right I'm going to fall back, I'm too weak. Instead of saying that, he said, okay, we'll obey the orders. But he's telling the Mexican government, I have no choice. It's not the orders from this captive that's making me fall back. Filosola, in defense of his actions, went so far as to suggest that even if Santa Ana had avoided the disaster at San Jacinto, a retreat was inevitable. He wrote from Victoria about three weeks after the battle on May 14, 1836, to the Secretary of War, Jose Maria Tornel, um, that on the 21st, the Mexican army on the Brazos was already in deep trouble. Here's what he said. The situation of the army was then under every aspect the most lamentable and discouraging even for the most intrepid and unthinking of men. He's probably talking about Urea then, in his own eyes. <laughs> uh, I can assure your excellency that even triumphing and without the misfortune of the 21st, the army would very, the army would very little have bettered their sad situation. As Steve Harden notes in Texian Iliad, Filosola says that it was not the Texans who had defeated the Mexicans but rather the inclemency of the season in a country totally unpopulated and barren, made all the more unattractive by the rigor of the climate and the character of the land. Filosola was no fan, at least not publicly here, of Texas. Here's what he said when he got back to Mexico City in August of 1836. Uh, Carlos uh, Eduardo Castaneda is the translator. Of all persons, I should be the last, this is Filosola speaking, of all persons, I should be the last to advocate the recognition of Texas as an independent nation, for I have just seen its immense unpopulated areas, its sandy wastes, its muddy fields, and its barren lands where there is not, nor can there be, any considerable population. Tell him to come to Houston. The few who lived there before the land was devastated could scarcely be distinguished from the native nomads. Now, Castaneda is an elegant translator, but I really prefer the translation that was done by George Lewis Hamilton in 1837 and published in the Texas Republic. Here's the same phrases uh, as, as circulated in the Texas Republic. Making an independent nation of, of Texas cannot appear more ridiculous to anyone than to me, as I have just come from seeing the, that immense desert, the largest part of its sand, another large portion mud, he saw a lot of mud in Texas. Ungrateful and unproductive in almost all the places where there is not nor has been a settlement of any consideration and where those that did exist before the devastation rendered the scanty inhabitants hardly distinguishable from the wandering tribes. You have to wonder after Miguel Soto's presentation if the general doth protest too much about how worthless he thinks Texas is. Filosola also claimed that on April 21st, his provisions were already low, his lines of supply were stretched to the breaking point, and his soldiers were starving barefoot and virtually naked. Many of them, he said, were ill with dysentery. In his representacion, uh, what, had been, what I was translating from just a moment ago, he says his troops faced famine, everything in Texas was burnt, abandoned, devastated. Santa Ana, Filosola said, left the army in such a state that retreat was necessary. Moreover, as Steve Harden summarizes the condition of the Mexican army under Filosola, the foul weather made forced marches or indeed travel of any kind nearly impossible given the lack of food and medicine, the large number of men 
in the Army actually proved a disadvantage. Uh, I'm not so sure about that, Steve. Uh, do we have to go and, and give Santa Ana credit for reducing the number of men that were disadvantaging Filosola by about 1,200? Um, uh, I'm not sure he was that much stronger uh, just because Santa Ana had subtracted that many from his forces. Nevertheless, Hardin finds Filosola's reasons to be compelling and suggests that the general made the right decision. Here's what Texian Iliad says. Filosola, a trained professional, cut his losses and preserved his force. Santa Ana had presented Mexico with one military disaster. Filosola did not wish to risk another. Hardin notes that the American volunteers, encouraged by Houston's victory, began pouring into Texas, while the Mexicans could expect no reinforcements, no ammunition, and no food. Wisely not wishing to risk his entire army by engaging the Norte Americanos in East Texas, says Hardin, Filosola crossed the Rio Grande with an exhausted and demoralized force, but he deserves credit for keeping the army intact and bringing it home. Both officers and men were eager to return for a second campaign that would erase the shame of the first. Now, there are two corollaries, as I see it, to Hardin's endorsement of Filosola's justification of his actions. First, the Texas Army was wrong to go to San Jacinto. If the Mexican army was on its last legs by being stretched that far into East Texas, then the thing to do is to stretch them a little further. Not to take your army down where you have no chance to retreat and risk losing the only army left in Texas. So if Filosola is right that the Mexican army was in deep trouble on the 20th, then it was probably a mistake at the Which Way Tree to go down towards Harrisburg rather than back to Nacogdoches, which I'm now convinced was what Sam was planning from the beginning. The second corollary, and this is where I start getting in real trouble here, the second corollary, if Filosola's right, and Hardin's right about Filosola, is that the Texan victory at San Jacinto is not decisive. Like many historians of the revolution, Hardin sees the Mexican disaster at San Jacinto the result of a series of blunders by the Mexican president that proved fatal, separating his detachment from the main army for a fruitless dash after the rebel politicians, contemptuously assuming that the Texans wouldn't dare to attack him once he had been reinforced on the morning of the 21st, letting down his picket guard when no action had transpired by the middle of the afternoon. But if San Jacinto were a disaster for more than just Santa Ana and his monumental ego, if it were really a disaster of fatal proportions for the Mexican army and the Mexican nation as well, then Filosola's assessment of the situation cannot stand. If San Jacinto is decisive, then Filosola can't be right. And if Filosola's right, then San Jacinto can't be decisive. Filosola, Filosola believed that the Mexican army was already at the end of its rope Remember, he argued that it was not the Texans who beat the Mexicans, but the inclemency of the season, et cetera, et cetera. Look at the logic. Isn't Filosola saying that if Houston had just kept moving east, the Mexican army was as good as beaten? And thus the great gamble that Houston's men, or Houston, depending on your point of view, took when they marched down into the area south of Buffalo Bayou was really unnecessary. And old Sam's strategy, if that's indeed what it was, of luring Santa Ana ever deeper into East Texas was really the best one. And the Texans really lucked out when Santa Ana blew it. If what Filosola said is true, then San Jacinto wasn't decisive. The campaign was already as good as lost, not by the Texans, but by the Mexicans. And thus the decision to go to San Jacinto just as General Houston's strategic retreat was being to pay off, was beginning to pay off, was a mistake. But doesn't this view of Hardin and Filosola stand at least our common interpretation of San Jacinto upside down? It's really an amazing interpretation. And that is that it's the Mexican army that's in big, big trouble on April 21st and not the Texans. That right before the battle, right before this miracle took place, Mexico was about to lose it. 
and the Texans, had they just kept moving east, would have won. I'm not sure I believe this, and I know G that General Urea didn't believe it, nor did the outspoken junior officer, Lieutenant Colonel Jose Enrique de la Peña, with whom I've been associated lately, they all thought that Filasola was wrong. However, and this is where I get in deeper trouble, their perspective does not make San Jacinto into a pivotal moment either. If we believe that, Felis, that what Filasola said is false, that is, that there was still a lot of fight left in the Mexican army, then San Jacinto still was not decisive. Recall the words of Professor Pohl in the official bulletin for the Texas State Historical Association. San Jacinto was a remarkable and major tactical victory, but not a strategic one. If the Mexican army, army is still a formidable force on the Brazos, then it becomes Filasola's timidity and not Santa Ana's blunder that takes the pressure off of Sam Houston. <laughs> now that I've become the skunk at the wedding, by suggesting that San Jacinto was not decisive, whether Filasola was right or wrong, let me make the case for Mrs. Powell's Tavern. I'm not suggesting that emulating the North Carolinians with the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse, we move the San Jacinto Monument down to Mrs. Powell's Tavern. However, we might want to prop the one up that the cattle knocked over. First, let's set the scene for April 21st. Early in the day on April 21st, Santa, Santa Ana and, and 1,200 men are here at San Jacinto. Filosola and Gaona, who has just come in from Bastrop and lost almost all the way back, uh, Filosola and Gaona with their two armies are at Fort Bend, Old Fort, Thompson's Crossing. Those are all pretty much synonymous terms. Urea, who had earlier been both at Mrs. Powell's Tavern and then uh, 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 near, at the Brazos had moved down a couple of days before to take both Columbia and Brazoria. He had taken Columbia with a good many supplies. He had taken Brazoria with a good many supplies. He had already caught a lot of supplies of the Texans when he took Matagorda after coming up from Goliad, and he was on his way to Velasco. In fact, Urea was already counting that ch that. Uh, uh, chicken before it hatched, Velasco, and he had good reason to. He was going to take it in the next day or so, and was already in passing, uh, anticipating a quick final blow uh, against the revolution at Galveston, where the politicians and civilians who were not headed for the safety of the United States in the runaway scrape had taken refuge. Urea on April 21st was a beat. He was confident. There were about 15 other Mexican soldiers in Texas uh, scattered around uh, occupying points such as Bayer, Copano, Goliad, Victoria, Matagorda. And Sam Houston and 910 men were at San Vicente, and there were scattered Texan detachments and home guards in places like Velasco or in East Texas where the Mexicans hadn't reached. Filosola hears of the disaster on the 22nd, although he said in his documents of the time, and even later in 1836, that it was the 23rd, it didn't take 48 hours for word from San Jacinto to get back to Old Fort. It was with le less than 24 hours. He immediately issues, off uh, Filosola issues orders to Urea to forget Velasco and turn around and get himself and all of his troops back to Old Fort. That was the first message, back to Old Fort, back to the Thompson Crossing on the Brazos immediately. He ordered him to pull out of Brazoria, pull completely out of Colombia, leave, and thus leave most of these provisions that he's just captured behind, and forego the capture of the very important port of Velasco. But Filosola doesn't wait at Old Ford for Urea. His next message says, meet me at Madame Powell's. And so Filosola abandons control of the Brazos crossing within two days after the Battle of San Jacinto before hearing of the fate of Santana. Could be a little hard feelings later on. You might think if he's willing to abandon that post on the Brazos before all the stragglers, and we know who straggler number one was, coming in from the battle had been given a chance to arrive. Filosola said he was afraid of the Texans shooting at him from the 
at, at, at Old Fort from the high ground across the Brazos. And he said he just couldn't take this. He wanted a more defensible place, and so he falls back all the way to Mrs. Powell's Tavern on the west end of Fort Bend County. Careful work on the Texan Army by Paul Lack of McMurray uh, University in a, his book, The Texas Revolutionary Experience, shows just how disruptive the victory was for Sam Houston. Um, about uh, uh, the, the Texans probably had a lot more to fear from Filosola at this point than Filosola had to fear from the Texans in the immediate aftermath of the battle. Sam Houston had 900 men and 600 prisoners. This is not exactly a comfortable situation, kind of like holding the wolf by the ears. About three quarters of the group that Sam Houston had with him on April 21st had been Texian citizen soldiers on short-term or unspecified enlistments, and they soon started drifting away. In fact, three weeks after the battle, by mid-May, Houston had less than a third of the 1,282 men who received credit for Santa Jacinto service. Houston's got down an army of 400 men three weeks after San Jacinto. Houston knows it's dangerous. Listen to Houston writing to Ned Burleson on April 30th, seven days after the battle. Keep all the boats on this side of the river. He's talking about the Brazos. He is by no means sure that the danger is over, even after he's telling the Texas public that the Mexicans are rapidly retreating. And remember what Houston's worries were the day of the battle when he had Vince's bridge torn down and burned. That's to keep those Mexican reinforcements from coming in before he had a chance to do his work. Well, why is Filosola leaving so precipitously? I would add to Miguel's reasoning that if indeed he wanted his lands to be more valuable, he knew they would be more valuable with Americans in Texas than not. If you look at what Francisco Ruiz and Jose Antonio Navarro and the Seguin family, all Bejarenos in San Antonio said is that we want industrious settlers in here because that what ma that's what makes our property more valuable. Ruiz said, I don't care if they're from hell itself as long as they'll work hard. And there's no question that many Mexicans believe that Texas became more valuable steady as more, steadily as more Americans came in. Unfortunately for them, Texas became a more difficult property, a more difficult province to hold as more Americans came in. It's a Faustian bargain. And who knows where Filosola came down uh, in that Faustian bargain. Uh, but I can tell you that with all the Americans run out of Texas, Filosola's lands weren't going to be worth much in his lifetime. And so I would suggest that as a reason, if there is one, that his land speculations may have influenced what he did. From his own words, we know he was spooked by the steamboats. His men had seen the Yellowstone come down past them at San Felipe after, they, after the Yellowstone had ferried Sam Houston's troops from across the Brazos uh, to Gross's. He also knew the difficulty for the Mexicans of crossing rivers without their own vehicles of that kind. He, uh, vehicles is a poor word there. Uh, either with supplies or in coordinating forces. I mean, it's bad to be in the springtime in Texas and have your troops scattered out uh, on different kinds of rivers. So Filosola is not a total fool, but was it wise to stop the campaign in its tracks when victory was so close on April 22nd and 23rd after the Battle of San Jacinto? General Urea gets the message on his way down just as he's about to leave Brazoria for Velasco, and he can't believe what Filosola is telling him. Pull back. All of your troops. He writes this letter to Sesma, General Ramirez de Sesma, on the 25th. Um, I'll quote just a little of it. Parece que el diablo no se ha llevado, ¿no es verdad? It appears the devil has taken us, right? ¿Qué sucede con el señor presidente? What's happened to the president? ¿Ha muerto? Is he dead and are we certain of the truth? No podemos rescatar a lo menos sus cenizas? Can't we even at least retrieve his ashes? Bien hemos quedado. A fine mess we're in. 
I had to have help translating that last one. <laughs> it's sarcastic and idiomatic. Urea later apologized for the undignified tone of this note that he wrote to Sesma as he was hurrying back. He noted that in addition, in addition to everything else that was going on around him, while he was writing the note in the field, he was assaulted by an enormous viper. He was feeling snake bit in more than one way. <laughs> Urea was having a very bad day. But very seriously, Urea in this same message goes on to question the wisdom of abandoning the post on the Brazos crossing, but withholds judging the valor of the second in command. And whenever you put yourself in writing, I withhold judgment of the valor of the second in command, it means you're questioning the valor of the second in command, or at least you're questioning his wisdom. Imagine Urea's state of mind from such a high to such a low. Um, he had been ordered to abandon the provisions that he had captured to give up taking that port that would have achieved, in his view, the success of the campaign. Also listen to what Urea is saying on the 22nd as he writes back to Sesma. Si quiere harina, pídamela. Ahora no nos falta. If you need wheat, ask me for some. We've got all we need. We're not lacking any. He had picked up lots and lots and lots of provisions that the Mexican army needs. He's not talking about ammunition. He's talking about the food to have them live off the land. If you need flour, ask me for it. We don't lack it now. Other officers observed at the time that Urea's army was not lacking supplies. He later maintained that many supplies had been captured and noted that he had let headquarters know about it. And Filosolo writes later, no, he didn't either. To some extent, Filosola and Urea had each at least seemed to have seen a very different face of Texas as they moved across it during this campaign. On Filosola's route, indeed, Gonzalez and San Felipe had been burned by the Texans. A lot of the livestock moved away or taken or scattered. But Jose Enrique de la Peña, who's with Filosola, says he saw evidence of supplies being burned or thrown in the river or left behind when Filosola left Old Fort. And he also noted that a lot of food and supply scarcities on the part of the soldiers were caused by hoarding and profiteering on the part of officers and settlers with the Mexican army. In contrast to what Filosola saw, on Urea's route, especially after he moved unopposed past Coleto after Fannin surrender, there was a rich bounty, both public and private. Some of the best reports of the supplies on Urea's route comes from one of my favorite little guys, Hermann Ehrenberg, the 19-year-old German uh, volunteer who had been a Goliad survivor and was trying to escape back to where Sam Houston's army was. As he walks towards the Colorado between the Guadalupe and the Navidad, he sees plantations with chickens, pigs, turkeys, cattle. On the Navidad, the barns were filled to the roof with corn, says Ehrenberg. When he gets into Urea's camp and he goes into Urea's camp, uh, uh, essentially captured a second time, but with a story that he's just a wandering German peddler and who had been left sick at a farmhouse. And, and he's, he says, you know, is there a war on or what? This is a Goliad survivor. Um, but the Mexican army buys his story. We know that because in the De La Pena papers is the itinario of the San Luis Potosí Battalion. And there they say, when they're up marching up here, encontramos en la margen derecha, we found on the right bank, Una habitación de americanos, y en ella un joven prusiano. And in this house of the Americans on the right bank, we find a young Prussian uh, who had been left there sick by the fleeing colonists. And in his autobiography, his memoir of the revolution, published in Leipzig uh, in German in 1843, this is precisely what Ehrenberg says was the cover story he gave to the Mexican army. So Ehrenberg goes into, it finds himself in Filosola's camp, and the first thing they offer him is hot chocolate. Uh, then he eats his fill and beefsteaks and frijoles. Uh, as they reach deeper into the colonies with Urea's army, uh, even though some of the cattle had been driven away, many remained, and food supplies galore were found in Matagorda as well as on the plantations. When he escaped from the Mexicans a second time and from Matagorda, uh, after they tried to float some of the prisoners down the intercoastal waterway, um, or the 1836 version of that. 
Um, he finds plantations filled with food, provisions in abundance, and in the last plantation that he gets to before he links up with the Texas Army again, he finds that some other Goliad survivors have already arrived there, and they've got warm cornbread ready for him. They've got milk, they've got beefsteaks, and they've got some books to read. So Filosola's statement that Texas had been devastated, wiped out, burned, made into a desert, just really doesn't hold water when you take a look at the eyewitnesses who are with him. But nevertheless, Filosola and Orea bring very different perspectives to the meeting at Mrs. Powell's Tavern. Somewhat different versions of this meeting are related by Urea and Filosola, but I believe that Filosola's own record tends to confirm Urea's recollections more than his own. Moreover, his account of the circumstances surrounding the reaction to San Jacinto seem self-servingly distorted. He repeatedly dated that message to Urea to come back quick on the 23rd. It was the 22nd. That it's doubling in terms of time, the, um, the distance between him and San Jacinto when he's at Old Fort, and he does the same thing when he get to, gets to Madame Powell's. He writes to the Mexican government that Madame Powell's tavern is 50 leagues from San Jacinto. That's 130 miles. It's about 60. He's more than doubling the distance between where he's making the decision and the battlefield at San Jacinto. Well, when they get together on the 25th, Generals Filosolo, Urea, Antonio Gaona, Joaquin Ramirez, Cisesma, Andre and, uh, Adrian Wall, the Frenchman, Eugenio Tolsa, and Pedro Ampudia, the commander of the artillery, Filosolo reports a consensus to withdraw beyond the Colorado, to establish a base of operations, to establish contact with the Mexican interior, to get new supplies, and then reassess the situation. So remember, still no word from Santa Ana. This is a retreat that is Filosola's doing. There is not a single order from Santa Ana at this point. Urea later claimed that he argued against the retreat. Filosola denies this, but seems, at least to me, as I read between the lines of the minutes from that meeting at Mrs. Powell's Tavern, that uh, that Araya made a pretty strong case, and some of his own men later said that he had argued against the retreat. Um, he says that both withdrawals, the one from Old Fort and the one from Madame Powell's, were sensible. If you're trying to translate Spanish after two years at Henrietta High School, like I do, you can be fooled by false friends sometimes. Sensible doesn't mean sensible. It means grievous, lamentable, um, too bad, not a good thing. Nevertheless, and this is where I'm reading between the lines, Filosola uh, is told by Urea that he and his troops will follow any orders they're given ciegamente, blindly. There's a great uh, proverb in Spanish, in la tierra de los ciegos, el tuerto es rey. In the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. Uh, I would suggest that the one-eyed man at Mrs. Powell's Tavern is Jose Urea. In his memoir, Filosola said that he had offered to give up his command at Madame Powell's Tavern. I don't see any evidence of this whatsoever. The minutes of that meeting say that he says, look, I'm the general, it's my decision, but I want to hear what you all say. And all but Urea say, let's get out. Let's go to the Colorado, maybe to Matamoros, but let's get out. And so they leave Mrs. Powell's behind, and on the 26th, they cross the San Bernardo, and they step, as Greg Dimmick will be telling you in a few minutes, very soon into the Mar de Lodo, the Sea of Mud. <laughs> ¶¶ 